At the 2005 Tokyo Game Show, Nintendo unveiled an innovative new motion controller for their upcoming console, the Revolution, later known as the Nintendo Wii. The preview trailer showcased the controller's possibilities. It could be used to conduct a symphony, go fishing, or chop vegetables. But one of the more appealing options was to use the controller with sports games. When the Wii finally launched in late 2006, it came packaged with Wii Sports, which used the Wii Remote in five sports games. And one of my personal favorites was the baseball game. It was so satisfying to swing the Wii Remote and hear the crack of the bat as you hit a home run. The Nintendo Wii was a colossal hit, and Wii Sports along with the Wii Remote was a big part of its success. But what if I told you that another company had this same idea and brought it to market more than 10 years earlier? This is Sports Science's Batter Up Bat, a motion-controlled bat compatible with just about every baseball game made during the 16-bit era. Sadly, like most early motion control devices, it provided a somewhat shallow experience and it quickly faded into obscurity. Let's learn more about the Batter Up Bat, the company behind it, and why it was a forgettable product. In the late 80s, a former communications executive named John D. Lips was frustrated. Lips was an avid golfer who lived in Ohio, and he wanted a way to practice golf at home during the cold winters. Luckily, Lips had a degree in engineering, so he set out to create a solution. He noticed the rising popularity of laser-like toys and thought he could apply the technology to sports equipment. Light doesn't bend, so the lasers could be used as an extension for a golf club. In October of 1991, Lips formed a company, Sports Sciences, and recruited engineers to develop a prototype for his idea. And in November of 1992, they released the Pro Swing System. The Pro Swing System included a shortened golf club and a floor panel that resembled a snowboard. Infrared signals from the club communicated with sensors in the floor panel. The Pro Swing System could analyze a user's swing, calculate shot distance, and more. It could also interface with a PC. Users could play Country Club Golf, a modified version of the popular Lynx golf game. It was a neat piece of technology, but it was expensive. The base system was $299, but for all the extras, including the Country Club Golf game and additional courses, the total price could reach $800. Because of the steep cost, the Pro Swing system was available primarily in specialty retail outlets, like computer and sports stores. There were also infomercials with golf pro Curtis Strange endorsing the product. Reviews of the Pro Swing system were hit and miss. Golf instructors noted it was helpful for beginners, but the system couldn't replace hitting an actual golf ball. Sports Sciences also wasn't generating any profit, so they set out to expand their market by leaning further into the video game industry. First, they converted the Pro Swing system into a full arcade game with a cabinet and safety nets. But this was another expensive product and likely only sold in limited quantities. Their next step was making a more affordable Pro Swing system for home consoles and PCs. In January of 1994, Sports Sciences released TV Golf for both the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. Retailing for $149, TV Golf was a motion controller compatible with popular 16-bit golf games, such as EA's PGA Tour Golf. In April of 1994, Sports Sciences released PC Golf for $199. The peripheral was compatible with several golf games, including Lynx 386 Pro and Picture Perfect Golf. Thanks to the lower price tags, these products were available at more retail outlets such as Best Buy, Sears, Software Etc., Meyer, and more. But while sales increased, Sports Sciences still couldn't generate a profit. The company even went public in April of 1994 to generate funding for manufacturing and research and development. Despite financial struggles, Sports Sciences was confident their next product would put them in the green. At the 1994 Summer Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, they unveiled the Batter Up Bat for the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. 
The bet was much cheaper than their previous products, with a suggested retail price of $69.99. It also tapped into a much larger demographic. Golf was more of an adult sport, but baseball appealed to kids as well, and kids played a lot of video games. Sports Sciences generated some hype for the batter-up bat, claiming it was the first virtual reality baseball bat. The product was also featured on Good Morning America. In September of 1994, Sports Sciences shipped Batter Up to retail stores. But would consumers bite? Well, here it is, the Batter Up Bat. Before we get into the hardware, I'd like to point out the box art for Batter Up. It's terrible. This realistic fisheye lens art style was somewhat popular during the 90s and even into the early 2000s. You saw it in advertising campaigns for Levi's and Tony's Pizza. It was also used a lot on Trapper Keeper binder covers. This box art was obviously targeted toward children. Still, there's just something unsettling about it. I'll be looking at the Super Nintendo version of Batter Up, but the Genesis version is nearly identical. The bat measures 24 inches long, about 10 inches shorter than a standard professional baseball bat. It's made of foam and plastic, so it's pretty lightweight. All the bat's electronics are in the middle of the barrel. There are also buttons for all the inputs of a standard Super Nintendo controller, minus the shoulder L and R buttons. There is a dip switch that adjusts for compatibility with specific baseball games. At the end of the bat is a 12-foot long controller cord, which gives you plenty of room to swing away. There is also a metal clip that attaches to the belt loop on your pants. This is a safety precaution in case you lose grip of the bat and it flies out of your hands. Sports Sciences was clearly concerned about safety. The manual also recommends the user wear batting gloves and rubber-soled shoes while using the bat. So how does the batter up bat work? It's pretty simple. Instead of using infrared signals, the electronics board inside the bat contains a small metal disc housed in a casing. When the bat moves, this disc comes out of the casing and makes contact with a switch, which signals a button press. The dip switches tell the batter up bat which button to press when the disc makes contact, because different baseball games use different buttons for swinging the bat. The manual contains settings for various baseball games and a section where users could write in dip switch settings for future baseball games. And that's literally it. Swinging the batter up bat is no different than pressing a button on the controller. But does batter up make your baseball games more exciting? I tested the bat with my favorite 16-bit baseball game, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Major League Baseball. And hey, it works. You have to get used to the timing, since swinging the bat isn't as fast as pressing a button, but pretty soon you'll be hitting line drives. The awkwardness comes after you hit the ball. You must quickly shift to using the buttons in the middle of the bat to control base runners. And playing defense is very difficult using these buttons. I recommend playing the game with auto fielding, so you don't have to worry about it. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, with all those buttons on the bat, can you play non-sports games? Yes, you can. The batter up bat works like a regular controller, but without L and R buttons. For example, I played Super Mario World just fine, and swinging the bat made Mario jump, which was amusing. Because it was the holiday season, I also tested the bat with Home Alone 2. It was rough. So there you have it, the batter up bat. Unfortunately, it's more of a novelty than a game-changing experience. And reviewers felt the same way. Electronic Games wrote, the batter up peripheral comes across more as a toy than a tool. Granted, that is what it is marketed as, but it could have been much more. And at $70, it was an expensive toy. It seemed as though many people who used the bat were disappointed. But I think there was confusion about how the bat worked. In a press release, Sports Sciences tried to explain its functionality, claiming, the trajectory of the ball after a user swings is projected on a video diamond on the TV screen. This probably led people to believe that the user's swing was critical when using the batter up bat. But what Sports Sciences failed to mention is that the power and trajectory of the ball are all determined in the game, not the bat. So again, swinging the bat is no different than pressing a button on the controller. 
Now that's not to say Sports Sciences wasn't thinking about future possibilities. In their patent for the bat, the company stated that enhanced forms of the invention may detect more information about the swing, such as speed, height, upward or downward angle, etc., to perform a better simulation of gameplay. They even had mock-ups of a version that used infrared signals with a home plate sensor. A few magazines suggested there was a wireless version of Batter Up coming out. It had a suggested retail price of $129, but as far as I know, Sports Sciences never released it. After the Batter Up batch release, Sports Sciences sales increased. The company's fourth quarter sales were up two-thirds compared to the previous quarter. Sports Sciences products were now in over 4,000 retail stores. Popular Science Magazine even selected the Batter Up bat as one of their best of what's new technologies for 1994. At the 1995 Winter Consumer Electronics Show, Sports Sciences introduced a PC version of the Batter Up bat, demonstrated by Seattle Mariners manager Lou Pinella. It seemed like things were turning around for the company, but behind closed doors, all was not well. Sports Sciences still failed to generate any profit. The problem was that a huge portion of the company's resources was tied up in licensing deals and agreements with Sega, Nintendo, and software developers. Founder John D. Lips hoped the company would make its first profits in 1995, but it never happened. By the summer of 1995, less than a year after the product hit store shelves, stores were discounting the batter up bat down to $39.99. There was also a new generation of consoles on the way. Sports Sciences had to scramble and come up with new products. They announced they were developing golf, baseball, and racing accessories for the Sega Saturn, Sony PlayStation, and Nintendo 64. But those accessories never came out. By 1996, Sports Sciences was on its last legs. In April of that year, they announced they intended to merge with a California-based virtual reality company called Worldview Technologies. Sports Sciences hoped this merger would allow them to develop their own games with online capabilities. But the deal fell through when Worldview Technologies withdrew from the agreement. As a result, Sports Sciences stocks plunged 40%. Founder John D. Lips estimated the company needed eight to $10 million to stay afloat. In 1997, there was a glimmer of hope. Sports Sciences secured about $1.3 million in private equity financing and renamed itself Smart Games Interactive. They hoped a new advertising strategy focused on catalog sales, show exhibits, TV ads, and shopping mall demonstrations would help turn things around. Smart Games Interactive also renamed its products to match the new name. The batter up bat became Smart Baseball. But the new name didn't help. The Batter Up Bat ended up being the company's final product. By 1998, Smart Games Interactive ceased operations. The story of the Batter Up Bat is all too familiar. Early motion control devices such as the Power Glove, U-Force, and Rollin' Rocker failed because of high costs, primitive technology, and a lack of good software. But the Nintendo Wii marked the dawn of a new era of motion controls. The Wii Remote used a new technology that made tracking more reliable, and games were specifically designed around the controller. It made for a better overall playing experience. The Batter Up Bat may have been the self-proclaimed first virtual reality baseball bat, but it wasn't anything special. It's fun for a few swings, but the novelty quickly disappears. That's all for this episode of The Gaming Historian. Thanks for watching. Funding for Gaming Historian is provided in part by supporters on Patreon. Thank you.